What's up guys, I'm Aaliyah. Welcome to The Courageous Church. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us, especially if this is your first time to be here. And I'm Elijah. Are you interested in leading a small group? This is one of the best ways to become needed and known here at TCC. You can register your small group today. At South, head to the Orange Room, and at North, the Community Room. Whether you have led a small group for years, or you have never led one and you just have questions, the team is here to help. Oh, and you get this great t-shirt when you sign up your group. We have Baptism Sunday, Step 1 of Growth Track, and College Days all happening next week. If you would like to get baptized next week, all you need to do is show up. It's that easy. We'll have everything you need. Take that next step, and we can't wait to celebrate baptism with you. And if you want to join the Dream Team, you can do so by getting started in Growth Track. These are the three easy steps for you to discover your place here at TCC. Next week is step one of Growth Track, and it will be happening at 11 a.m. Snacks and child care are provided. Make plans now to be there. And join us as we welcome back all our college students next week. We want all alumni and current college students to come to church wearing your college colors. Oh, and there's an awesome giveaway. They'll be drawing for an iPad at both of our locations. So if you're currently in college, sign up next week for a chance to win. Invite your friends and we're so excited to see you there. Thanks for hanging out with us today. We hope you have an awesome week. We're in chapter four, the final chapter of Jonah, and it is one of those weird, twister, what kind of endings, and it leaves us with a little bit of tension, and so we're going to do that today. Now, here's the story of Jonah in a nutshell. God calls Jonah to go tell the Ninevites to turn toward him. Jonah's like, "Uh uh-uh, see ya, I'm not doing that, and he goes and tries to get as far away as he possibly can from where God wanted him to go, which was Nineveh. He went to a place called Tarshish. I'm glad I won't have to say that next week. And so on his way, a storm comes, and, and they're going to all die. They ask who he is. He's like, it's me. I'm running from God. I'm disobedient to God. So they throw him overboard. He's going to die, he thinks, and then he's swallowed by a big fish. And then the big fish, while he's in there for three days and three nights, swims him over to the bank and vomits him out, bleh, vomits him out right on the bank. And so um, Jonah's like, you know what? Um, I'm going to do the right thing now because God asked me to. So he goes and he preaches a very angry message to the Ninevites like, in just 40 days, y'all going to die. Welcome to the jungle. We got fun and games. You're going to die. Like that's how he approached it. No love and compassion. No like a funny thing happened to me today on the way to the church. <laughs> None of that. He was like, yeah, God, I'm It was intense. So Jonah has preached to these people that are crazy barbarians that had pyramids built of skulls from the people that they had attacked, murdered, and destroyed, tortured, and such. So now we pick this story up in Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. When Jonah preached, something crazy happened. The Ninevites are like, yeah, we've had enough of our evil ways. We're going to turn toward God. Let's all declare a fast, the kids, the babies, everybody. We're all going to put on garments of mourning. We're even going to put the garments of mourning on our livestock. All you people that like to decorate and make your animals wear clothing. This was the perfect scenario for you in biblical times. And so they would put like sackcloth, it's called, garments of mourning, on their livestock and their family dog and all this. And and, and Jonah's shocked by this. He didn't expect the barbarians to turn. He didn't expect the barbarians to hear him. He was kind of looking forward to their untimely demise because he didn't like them. But Jonah chapter 3 verse 10 is where we pick it up, okay? When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned toward him, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Jonah, we would think during this time, would be like, yeah, I'm the greatest preacher that ever lived. 120,000 people live there. 120,000 people repented at one time. Like on my best Sundays, like, you know, six people are like, yeah, I believe it. Like, hallelujah. I think I'll go another week. But 120,000 were like, 
Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Your presence is heaven to me. Like, you don't know that song. If you did, I guess it'd be funny. But can you imagine how Jonah must feel like? Man, God really used me. I made a difference today. My dream team was rocking. I'm a one-man dream team. I mean, you can imagine, like, if Jonah had preaching buddies, they'd be getting the Gatorade and, like, pouring it over his head, like, yeah, Super Bowl, Jonah, celebrate. Jonah is not like this at all. This is the bad ending for Jonah, and this is the weirdness of it, Jonah 4 and 1. But to Jonah, 120,000 people saved, including women and children, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. Don't know why, Jonah, you're mad, because all these people have been saved. Jonah does not feel good about this. Jonah is not happy about it. He's ticked off with God, and the rest of this, this chapter is about Jonah and his emotions. Nineveh is no longer a thing. It's about Jonah and his heart toward God. There's some problems with grace, people. Grace is so good, and it's something that you... I remember Bishop Jake's preaching one time in Dallas, Texas, he said... He said, I want you to know something about God's grace. It's promiscuous. You ever, you ever heard of somebody who's promiscuous? Like, they'll make out with anybody. You know what I'm talking about? Where my high schoolers at? You know what I'm talking about. Promiscuous, like grace, the grace of God is given freely. It's a promiscuous grace. Like that is what Bishop Jake said. I would never say something like that. But he did, and it's interesting because he was upset that they... Got grace, okay? So verse 2 talks about now what Jonah does. Jonah prays to the Lord. Verse 2, he prayed to the Lord. Jonah only prayed two times in this whole story. He prayed when he was in trouble and when he was mad at God. Those are the only two times he prayed, when he was mad and when he was in trouble. Our prayer life and our relationship to God cannot just be when we have emotional trauma. Now, I'm not telling you not to pray during those times, but I am saying we should relate to God in the good times and the bad times and the medium times and the three-quarter tank times and the quarter tank times when you're running on empty times all those times we should open the conversation with God Jonah never figured that out and so my first point for you is this if you want to have a right art toward people that God gives grace to is this never settle for a crisis driven relationship with God oh I gotta make the rent money Lord Jesus he'll hear you but you'd be better off if you just praise him when things are going good and so there is something more to Christianity than, than getting out of trouble. It's relationship with God. It's knowing God. It's experiencing joy. God is most satisfied in us when we're most satisfied in him. We are to find joy in our relationship with God. And so this is a mistake Jonah made over and over again. Now let's look at what made Jonah so angry in the next part of this verse. He prayed, then he said, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. Now we see Jonah's heart. Jonah kind of knew this was going to happen. He knew God was good. He said, I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God. Now he starts quoting, he starts quoting the Bible. He starts quoting Moses here. How many of you know we can have the worst spirit and still know a lot of Bible? How many of you know the nastiest people you've ever met were people that had a lot of scriptures memorized? Oh, Lord, we're in that kind of church this morning, aren't we? <laughs> It's true. Like, it's, not, it's not what you know. It's what, you, it's what your heart embraces. And so he's like, I knew that you were a gracious, God, gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. His problem is not with doctrine because he knows doctrine. He knows Bible. His problem is emotional. I did not want this to happen. I did not want you to give grace. You gave it to me, and that was all good, and I turned toward you in the belly of that fish, but now when I see you turning toward others, I got a big problem with you people. It's time for the airing of grievances. Bring out the Festivus poll. Like that is what. He's like, I don't want that. I want it for me, but I don't want it for other people. And that is the problem with a religious mindset. I want it for me. But no, not for them. They need to grovel and suffer. How could God be good to them? I mean, I somewhat deserve it. Come on, somebody. You know God. When he gives you good things, it's like you are a righteous judge and wise in your judgments, Lord. And then when he does it for other people, you're like, what? Why, why would you do that? And so Jonah's flipping out. He becomes an emotional wreck. He is just, he's taking it up to a whole nother level. Verse 3, now, Lord, 
because you have, you know, saved 120,000 people's lives. Just kill me. Take away my life. For it's better for me to die than to live. He's so angry. He's suicidal. I knew it. I knew you were going to do this. I didn't want to start this. I ran away because of this. What is it when you have a predisposed bias against an entire group of people that even God's grace can't awaken you to? That's called racism. And Jonah had some racism in him. Jonah had some nationalism in him. He did not want other people groups to experience the grace of God like his people group had experienced the grace of God. And that was sin. Jonah had sin in him. The root of a nationalistic viewpoint, the root of a racist viewpoint is sin, sin, sin. And the church said, yeah. Let's just read a few scriptures that bring everything back to ground zero in relationship to racism, nationalism, and the sin of preference in our hearts toward others. James 2 and 9. Read it out loud with me on the screen. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. If we prefer one people group over the other people group, it is sin. The foot the footing and the ground is level at the cross of Jesus Christ. Psalms 86 and 9, let's read it together. It says, All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. Say, All the nations. All. Ain't going to be no segregated heaven. 1 John 2 and 11. Let's all read it out loud. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Jonah did not want these people to be saved, and emotionally he could not process the fact that God went and saved 120,000 people that he would have liked to have seen wiped off the face of the earth. And Jonah had good reason for it because the Assyrians had tormented his people. They were barbarians, and Hosea prophesied one time that if uh, Israel didn't turn to God, God was going to use the Assyrians to wipe them out. And so Jonah's like, well, if God wipes them out, that'll never come to pass, and we can live however we want to live. It's, it, was a, it was a weird thing to call Jonah to go talk to these people that he hated. It was like sending a Jew to preach to Nazis in a concentration camp. It was an emotional thing for him. And Jonah is living in the middle of a great contradiction. God has been good to me, but I resent God being good to somebody else. And that's the problem with grace. We can't be selfish with God's grace. Amen? God gives his grace where he wants to. And so this is something that Jonah received. He received a second chance, but yet he didn't want it for others. And if we're not careful where the rubber meets the road, the people that have hurt us, the people that have disappointed us, the people that have wounded us, the people that have scarred us, the people that continually disrespect us, the people that have walked out of our lives, we can want grace for us, but we want judgment on them. We may not say it, but deep down in our heart, we're like, get him, God, sick him, God. I know you would never. No, that is how we are. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a warning to all of us. You've been told you're ugly, that you're not worth anything, that you'll never amount to anything. Maybe your friends left you hanging and they talk bad about you, spread rumors, lies, and put out passive aggressive posts about you on Facebook. And you're hanging on to unforgiveness. And you're like, boy, get them, pastor. <laughs> oh, preach to them, pastor. Well, maybe you don't feel that right now, but I guarantee you every one of us has resentment in our heart in some way. And resentment can feel more sophisticated and vague and smaller. But if you let resentment hang in your heart two and a half years from now, it's going to be unforgiveness full blown. Maybe you resent your spouse because of the way they spend money or the way they don't meet your needs, or the way they don't communicate as they should. Maybe you're resentful toward somebody in your past. And Jonah was living with all that resentment and all that anger and all that frustration and we do too, and we have to live in freedom. And so in our heart, we can't desire for God to withhold his grace from anybody. Reach them all, let God sort them out. We gotta get rid of it, okay? And we can't just desire good for us and just whatever for others. Like we have to desire God's justice, which is grace and favor for others, not just ourselves. This is a grace place. It's uncomfortable and messy, but it's a grace place. And we often desire that justice from God for ourselves, make it right. But what about others? Our hearts have to desire God's grace for others. Our hearts have to desire God's justice. And there's a quote 
haunting me that Dr. Martin Luther King wrote in his letters from a Birmingham jail, and I want to read this to you, and I think it was inspired for our nation. I want you to listen to it, okay? He says this, writing from a Birmingham jail, I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate. Here's what I want us to all key on when it comes to justice and God's goodness given to others. The white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice. More devoted to order than to justice. Who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. Who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action. Who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. Who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill, shallow understanding of people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. This is a tension we all need to be aware of when it comes to not just my comfort, but the comfort of others. Not just my salvation, but the salvation of others. Not just justice for me, but justice for others. We as believers must be committed to justice over established order, righteousness over convenience, and truth over popular acceptance. Our hearts must desire God's righteousness, the righteousness intended by our creator without regard to societal expectations. Christ has changed our hearts to love and we must proactively, not passively love people. We must love personally and not politically. This is the justice that we must seek from God for everybody and the church says yeah. That's it. And so Jonah fell into this trap. I desire justice for me but I'm not concerned about others. Jonah 4 and 4 goes on. The Lord replied to Jonah, he's like, hey, Jonah, is this right for you to be angry? Jonah never answers. Jonah gets mad and walks out. God's like, Jonah, come on, 120,000 people repented, and you're angry and you're bitter. And Jonah's like, God, I'm okay if you love me. I don't don't want you, though, to love them. I, I, I want it my way and not the way that you may do it. His struggle is with love, and our struggle is going to be with love. If you've ever experienced the forgiveness of God, do you, do you still find it hard to forgive your brother, your sister, or the person that lives in your house? God help us all. How many of you remember uh, that, that old, back in the, like when Christopher Reeve was Superman back in the day in the movies, right? Remember that one Superman? I don't know which, which, which one it was, but Superman like turned bad and Superman got drunk and like had a fist fight with Clark Kent. Remember anybody? Remember that? Yeah, it happened. It's in a Superman movie, and, 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 and it's interesting because that's so against the character of Superman. Like, Superman's supposed to be taking care of people and fixing stuff, and he didn't. Remember that movie, Bad Santa? Now, that's rated R. I don't know what y'all doing walking around watching that trash, polluting your... Bad Santa is a movie that was like, it was, a, it was, a, it was like a, a weird twist because, you know, Santa's supposed to be good, isn't he? Oh, ho, 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 right? This is what we're like. We're like... Clark Kent, who, I mean, we're like Superman who gets drunk and fights Clark Kent and bad Santa when we have received so much grace, but we don't want it for somebody else. For us to receive grace and not show it is very weird and very sad, like bad Santa and mean Superman. And so Jonah is so ticked off, verse 5, he had gone out and sat down in a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Now, Jonah's ignoring God. He's acting like a man baby. He's pouting and he gets his chair and he gets his eclipse glasses and he's waiting there for some event to happen, you know, from the sky, fire from heaven, city buses falling. He got his lawn chair, he's got his drink, he pulls his sandals off, he builds shade over his head, listening to smooth jazz, going, I'm waiting for destruction, destruction, terror, and mayhem. Pass me a sissy song, sucker, I'm saying, what? 
What? I'm ready. You're ready. I think I'm going to bomb us. That was LL Cool J. Mama's going to knock you out. I suggest everybody listen to it and worship the Lord your God. There's nothing better than a little old school rap to bless pastor's soul. This should not be the awkward scenario that we're seeing at the end of this book. Jonah had experienced so much, and he's still just as hard in his heart as he's ever been. No matter what you've done for God, like, listen, people, I took a month off of preaching, okay, and it was great, but I realized so much of what I do has to be about preparation that I had to ask myself the question, Tyler, how's your soul doing? Without the pressure to preach, are you going to blow kisses to Jesus or not? Like, that is important for each and every one of us. Jonah was used mightily by God, but his heart was not really that deeply changed. So Jonah's sitting there with a bad spirit and a bad attitude. And so God wants Jonah to know that he loves him, verse 6. And the Lord, he, I guess his shade that he made wasn't good enough, kind of like the aprons that Adam and Eve made to cover their sin wasn't good enough. Mm. And so somebody had to cover it. And his name is Jesus. So verse 6, then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his bald head, to ease his discomfort, and Jonah was very happy about the plant. Oh, I deserve a little bit of shade. I deserve a little bit of shade. He's thrown shade on 120,000 people. What, what? But he deserves a little bit of shade. And he has to come back to this understanding that we can never forget, and I talked about it last week, that God is all about second chances. And so God does an object lesson for Jonah, okay? He gives him a little bit of shade. Jonah's happy. He is satisfied. He is joyful over the shade. Verse 7, but at dawn the next day, the same God who provided the shade provided a worm. Say a worm. Where are my tequila drinkers at? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> but at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. Say wind. Say worm. Say wind, say whale. Wooka, wooka, woo. All these W words. God sent a whale, and he sent a worm, and he sent some wind. All things that were very uncomfortable to get Jonah's attention and to soften his hard heart. And if you're experiencing whales and winds and worms, it's a grace problem. You got to receive God's grace and let go of the bitterness and know that God is good all the time for everybody. And we're not calling balls and strikes for God. God loves Jonah. Jonah, I see you're hot, discontent, and acting poorly. I'm going to give you some shade, and, 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 and I'm going to show you I love you, and, but I can't leave you there in the shade because you're not going to grow. And so I'm going to take away the shade, and I'm going to send a scorching wind to get your attention. You see the word provided in all those things? God provided. It's like he knows what you need even though there's tension involved. God knows what you need. Sometimes he sends shade to protect you, and sometimes he sends worms, and sometimes he sends winds. And I want you to know that the worm is just as important as the shade. The tensions that pull us away from ourselves are just as good for us as the times when God uses that same grace to awaken us. And God was providing a real-life object lesson for Jonah there. We love serving the God of the shade that takes care of us. But I am so thankful for all the blessings that God's given me. And they are many, and I am, I am extremely blessed standing for you today. But I'm also thankful for the whale, and I'm thankful for the worms, and I'm thankful for the wind. I'm thankful for the abuse in my life and the broken family that caused me to find Jesus Christ as my source first. It was painful. I don't like to think about it. I don't like to relive it. I've blocked a lot of that out. But I found Jesus through all the tension. I thank God for all the scars on my life because it's allowed me to feel the pain of others. Did I enjoy it? Do I want to relive it? No. But the worms and the whales and the wind have made me keenly aware that I need God's grace, you need God's grace, and everybody needs God's grace. And so Jonah is so completely uh, 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 in a bad way, and God's like, all right, here, let's have a conversation. So God said to Jonah in verse 9, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Like, why? Are you, you, you have nothing but desire for murder in your heart for 120,000 people, but this plant you're weeping over and you're very sad. He's like, and he's like, is it right for you? And he's like, it is. I am more concerned with my own comfort than I am for people to receive God's grace. This is designed to be convicting for people to read. I am more concerned with 
maintaining my perfect little life and my comfort-ridden, pleasure-filled schedule, my selfish checkbook, my ways that draw me away from God's people, God's house, and God's plan. I'm all good with that, but, but I, 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 I'm not good if there's any tension at all. He's like, well, I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. I mean, if I was God, I'd be like, just stop. I'm going to go start over. This whole book, I'm throwing the book of Jonah in. The, we're starting over. You are so frustrating. Nobody can learn anything from you. Honestly, right? Verse 10, but the Lord said, look, you have been concerned about this plant, though you didn't have anything to do with tending it or making it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And he's like, something that had such a limited purpose on earth, something that I brought and I killed, it's, 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 it's just a small thing, Jonah. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? in which there are more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left hand, and also so many animals. It's like you care about your comfort and your creature comforts more than you care about my mission, Jonah. And we all need to understand that God's grace has been given to us for a reason. God's grace has been given to us because it is not all about you and it is not all about me. And he's saying to them, look, you got to understand, these people don't know any better. They don't know their right hand from their left hand. Y'all mad about them knowing you got all these scriptures memorized, Jonah? You're quoting scriptures to me about how you wish I wouldn't save them. They don't know nothing and you, who, who are you? You're not giving them anything from yourself. And then I think he's like, and so many animals, like, there's so much potential for sacrifice there. In that day, they would sacrifice animals to worship God. But then also, his, one commentator said he's probably making fun of Jonah. He's like, you want me to kill Coco, the golden retriever, who looks so cute in her little garment of mourning? Like, that's what you want me to do, Jonah? Like, wake up, man. Like, here's the message of Jonah. Remember when I told you at the, 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 the Day of Atonement, they would, read, they would read the book of Jonah. At the end, they would say, I am Jonah. Like they want, we we got to know this. We have these tendencies toward racism. We have these tendencies toward, toward selfishness. We have these tendencies toward wanting grace for ourselves and not wanting it for others. This is what Jonah never got. His life was designed by God to be about Nineveh. His life was designed by God to have a higher purpose. His life was designed by God to matter for more than serving comfort and ease and his own desires. My question for you is, is your life all about you? Or is it about something that really matters, like lost people, like Nineveh, like people that are far from God? When your life's all about you, you're like, oh no, I gotta keep every, every commitment at arm's length. I, I will not be in a small group. I will not lead a small group. I will not serve. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just come and y'all be thankful when I come and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll pay my cover charge like I'm in a strip club and that's all I'm gonna do. Open your heart to the lost. Want God's grace for others. Don't have a problem with grace because the problem with grace is when you've received it, it's still available for somebody else and you can't, you can't like withhold it. Serving others is what Jonah never figured out. That's why we have a growth track to give you a clear way to use your life for what really matters, serving others. That's why we put such an importance on small groups because including people in your life, in your home, is the best way to give people a foundation to grow spiritually. If you look back over your life, the times you grew the most, you can point to the relationships God used to make that happen. Our struggle is with love. And God is a lover of souls, a lover of the lost a lover of people that don't love him. And God in this sermon series is wanting us to understand that he chases us. God wants us to understand that he'll give you grace when you're underwater. God wants you to understand that he will always give second chances and God wants you to understand that, that there's a problem with grace. It's, it's for everybody and we can't withhold that. As you leave here today, I want you to know that your struggle will be with love. 
It's a tendency in the human heart to resist God. It's a tendency in the human heart to think that by creating distance between ourselves and the heart of God, somehow we'll be more satisfied. It is a lie. It is not true. Say this with me. I am Jonah. You feel what I'm saying in this place today? This ought to be the best, not because of guilt, but because of grace. This ought to be the most inclusive and amazing and far-reaching semester of small groups this church has ever had. We're bigger than we've ever been. Our hearts need to be bigger than they've ever been to include others. When it comes to allowing for more people to be receiving of God's grace, it takes people finding out what they are called to do and not doing the church or me a favor. Don't you dare do that. But serving because they know and you know in your heart it's all that matters. The souls of men and women, those Ninevites that others would say no to, my heart says yes to because it's been changed by Jesus. We need to be representatives, ambassadors of his grace, wanting it for everybody. And if there's anything in us that would say yes to us and no to others, God convict us and Lord help us to repent this morning turning to you.